We owe much to the ancient Greeks, from the invention of democracy, to citizens' participation in government, to the Olympic Games. The Greeks laid the foundations of science and created Western drama. The Romans conquered and unified Europe. Their greatest achievements lay in administration, infrastructure, and above all, their system of law. The Vikings stormed onto the world stage as raiders from the sea, but they went on to build a vast network of trade, and they were the first to discover America. Between them, these three peoples were the founders of Europe. Our journey into the past takes us to Rome, the heart of the greatest empire of the ancient world. In a swampy, plague-infested hollow on the Tiber, the greatest empire of ancient times was born. It was almost 3,000 years ago. In those days, only a handful of settlers lived on the hills of Rome. But in just a few centuries, Rome conquered all of Italy, and from there, much of Europe. The malarial Blackwater grew into an empire, the ruler of over 50 provinces. At the height of its power, the Roman Empire controlled most of the known world. The Imperium Romanum stretched from Scotland in the north, across Germania with its endless, impenetrable forests, as far east as the Black Sea and south to North Africa. Even the highly advanced Egyptians were subdued by the Romans, 60 million people surrendered to the invaders. Hundreds of thousands of well-equipped Roman legionaries conquered one country after another. Their weapons were the best in the world. Their campaigns were brilliantly organized. The Romans defeated the barbarians of northern Europe they overran the kingdoms of the east. They even captured the queen of Syria. Nothing and no one could stop the Imperium Romanum. Rome owed her supremacy above all to her legionaries. Some provinces were easier for them than others. Along the Rhine, they were mainly builders. They labored there for years on gigantic border fortifications. North of that line, known as the Limes, the legionaries suffered both from the cold and from constant attacks by Germanic tribesmen. Some worked in government administration or in procuring the supply of grain. There was work for them throughout the empire. Most legionaries were stationed in border areas. At the time of Augustus, there were 28 legions, which means 170,000 men with an equal number of auxiliaries. The achievements of the legionaries and their commanders were commemorated on Trajan's column, which still stands on its original site in the center of Rome. In the Museum of Roman Civilization, there are dozens of plaster casts of the column. They are the most important source of information on how the legionaries led their daily lives. Alexandra Busch from the German Archaeological Institute in Rome is an expert on the Roman army. 
Wir haben hier eine Szene, in der römische Legionäre beim Lagerbau dargestellt werden. Wichtig ist aber, dass die Soldaten nicht nur ähm, ihre eigenen Lager und Unterkünfte errichteten, sondern auch an der Erschließung des Landes beteiligt waren. Das heißt, sie haben auch Straßen gebaut, sie haben Brücken gebaut. Legionäre haben nicht ständig gekämpft und mitunter waren sie mehrere Jahre lang überhaupt nicht im, im Kampfeinsatz, sondern haben etwa ähm, Patrouillengänge gemacht, haben Botendienste wahrgenommen, ähm, den Zollverkehr geregelt und gerade deshalb war es auch so attraktiv, für die römische Armee tätig zu sein. Wherever the Roman legions were stationed, they built a walled camp. In these far-flung forts, they kept watch on the borders. They seldom needed to go to war in full strength, but when they did, they were well prepared. Their weapons were second to none. Their javelins could fly over 15 meters and pierce any shield. If pulled out, they broke in two, hampering the enemy. Roman catapults, powered by animal tendons, could hurl rocks up to 300 meters. Caltrops, or crow's feet, made a battlefield impassable. The Romans even used animals as weapons. They put burning bundles of brushwood between cows' horns and drove the animals into the enemy ranks, while hoping that they wouldn't suddenly turn around. When a legion was on the move, it was like a giant piece of machinery being set in motion. Those who lived under Roman rule had to supply the food for the hundreds of legionaries and their animals. They not only had to hand over a large part of their harvest, but might also have to relinquish their water, their draft animals and their carts. Keeping the legions on the move was a mammoth operation because they always needed the same supplies, however far away they marched. Heavily laden, the legionaries could march in columns of thousands up to 30 kilometers a day. The Romans often cut a swathe through unpopulated territory. It was not uncommon for them to build camps in the wilderness, and they made an impression. They felled so many trees for building material and firewood that in some areas, entire forests vanished. Every day, a legion of 5,000 men needed over 8,000 kilos of grain for meals, 50,000 liters of water, and 18,000 kilograms of animal feed. A place in a legion was highly sought after, not only because of the guarantee of regular meals, but also because the army offered a fixed income, chances of promotion and security in old age. But the security came at a price. The legionaries often lived far from home for a very long time. Over time, towns grew up around many of the legion's camps. On the Rhine, the cities of Cologne and Koblenz both began as small Roman forts. Further south, the city of Mainz also dates back to Roman times, as does Regensburg on the Danube. The legionaries in these places copied the way of life in their capital. To live in Rome, that was what they dreamed of. Although only aristocrats could afford the best it had to offer. Pass doch auf. Tulia, pass mal mit an. Das ist ausgezeichnet. So wie immer. Flavius, bring uns noch von den Datteln. Und mehr Wein. <lacht> 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 
Gehst du morgen in die Arena? Ja, natürlich. Ich habe viel Geld auf diesen Gallier gesetzt. <lacht> oh ja, der Gallier. <lacht> du weißt schon, der Blonde, er ist sehr gut gebaut. Und sehr willig. Das hat mir die Frau des Konsuls unter vier Augen anvertraut. Oh. <lacht> Erzähl mir mehr darüber. Also, gestern habe ich Titus getroffen in der Therme. Bei ihm war dieser neue Afrikaner, der morgen gegen deinen Gallier kämpft. Ach, ja. Wenn du mich fragst, hat dein Gallier keine Chance gegen den Afrikaner. Du wirst schon sehen, er wird gewinnen. Tulia, bring uns die Haare. Na los! Sieh mal, hast du schon einmal etwas so Blondes gesehen? Aus Germanien für dich, deine Sklaven knüpft doch so tolle Perücken. Sie haben so schöne Haare, diese Barbaren. Ja, manchmal beneide ich sie. So wild und so frei. Na, ihr Hübschen, habt ihr schon genug? <lacht> The wealthy lived in magnificent houses. At Tivoli, east of Rome, is Hadrian's Villa, an imperial summer residence with gardens and fountains. But most of the population lived in blocks of rented flats. These ruins can still be seen in Ostia, Rome's port. On the ground floor, there were small shops and places to eat. On the upper floors, people lived in cramped quarters, without a toilet or kitchen. Many of these flats were very expensive, even the run-down ones. But a quarter of the city was public space, open to every citizen. People met in the Colosseum, the first multi-story arena. It seated 70,000 and even had awnings against the sun. For the poor, entry was free and bread was distributed. There had never been anything like it. In the Roman Forum, public trials went on every day. Anyone who wanted to could go and watch. Its many temples were also well frequented. All classes of Roman society mingled in the public squares. Rich or poor, slave or free, everyone went there. Rich senators, administrators who decided the fate of the empire, and their wives, the Roman matrons. Prostitutes plied their trade in innumerable brothels. To the Romans, it was quite normal. Most of the population were simple people. Only a small minority belonged to the privileged upper class. It made little difference whether the capital was governed by a king, the senate, or an emperor. The social structure of the population remained the same. At the peak of society were Rome's oldest families, the wealthy aristocracy. They held the top jobs in politics and the army. After them came the knights, successful merchants and rich men who had risen to the top in civil administration. Below them came the broad mass of plebeians, ordinary people, mainly craftsmen and farmers and their families. At the bottom were countless slaves, men and women living a life of drudgery so that the economy of the gigantic empire could prosper. Rome had several slave markets. Each week, fresh merchandise was offered. Many of those being sold were prisoners of war. Over the centuries, around 400,000 slaves were brought to the capital. Schaut, das sind Muskeln, oder? Ein iberischer Sklave. Sehr gesund. Keine Krankheiten, sehr robust. Für alle Arbeiten geeignet, ganz fresh reingekommen. Warte mal. Und er ist stark. 
Ich suche einen Sklaven, der etwas von Schreibarbeit versteht. Ich verstehe, Sie wollen keinen Arbeiter, sondern etwas für das Haus. Da haben Sie wirklich Glück. Ich habe genau das Richtige für Sie. Schauen Sie! Vielseitig und tüchtig, sowas findet man selten heutzutage. Und, meine Herren, sie ist auch was fürs Auge. Ich zeige sie Ihnen mal. Gut für Arbeiten im Haus und wunderschön. Das passt Oder nicht. Sie? Nein. Wirklich nicht. Setz dich. Ich habe da auch noch einen Griechen. Der könnte ihn vielleicht... Du hast doch einen Griechen? Ja, bring doch mal den Griechen. Seht ihn euch an, er ist klug. Ist was Besonderes. Und der Preis? Ein gelehrter Sklave. 100 Zestazen, mindestens. Was denken Sie? Ich gebe dir 20. Er spricht mehrere Sprachen fließend und schreibt sie auch. Und er kennt sich aus in der Medizin. Natürlich. Das ist so bei Griechen. Na gut. Dann nehmt ihn für 50 Sesterzen. Hier, du kannst es nachzählen. Ach nein, ich vertraue Ihnen. Hier bitte und viel Glück damit. Hier entlang. Only a minority of slaves worked as domestic servants. Most labored in the fields, in mines or in thermal baths. In central Sicily, the province of Enna boasts one of the best preserved Roman bathhouses. It is part of the Villa Romana del Casale, a luxurious country estate World Heritage listed since 1997. Qua siamo nei prefurni della Villa Romana del Casale. Queste sono delle grandi caldaie dove i servi buttavano la legna che serviva a riscaldare l'aria che poi attraverso questi cunicoli avrebbe riscaldato le terme. Questo è il pavimento, quindi io sono a quota più bassa. Qua sotto circolava l'aria calda che riscaldava l'ambiente. L'aria calda circolava anche dalle pareti verticali. Questa è la parte della villa che se fossimo in Oriente chiameremmo Ammam, è la zona della cura del corpo. I romani ci tenevano alla cura del corpo. The mosaics tell of this as well. They show slaves bringing massage oil into the baths. Female slaves are depicted too. They were to look after the women visitors. One of their duties was to dry their hair. Questa è la stanza più famosa della Villa Romana del Casale. Rappresenta le donne in bikini. Sono le palestriati. Ci sono i vari sport. C'è il peso, il lancio del disco, c'è la corsa, c'è la pallavolo e poi c'è la premiazione. Questo è un elemento strutturale molto importante della Villa Romana del Casale, è l'acquedotto. È la struttura che serviva a portare l'acqua dentro la Villa Romana. L'acqua dentro la Villa Romana serviva per le piscine, serviva per le cucine, ma serviva anche per rinfrescare l'aria durante l'estate. La Villa Romana era piena di fontane distribuite per eh, tutta la villa perché l'acqua è un elemento molto importante. The aqueduct was an invention of Rome's brilliant engineers. Their monumental waterways were also masterpieces of architecture. The head of the Roman water department wrote proudly, compare the rich variety of the constructions that bring us our water with the useless pyramids or the pointless edifices of the Greeks. There were five long-distance pipelines to Rome alone. Every day they brought in 900 million liters of fresh water, an average of 400 liters per person per day. The incoming water was stored in reservoirs, and from there it was directed via pressurized pipes to the distributing reservoirs in the city. Each part of town had its own public latrines, where people liked to meet to discuss personal or business matters. Rome also had several large baths and over a thousand wells to provide a constant source of fresh drinking water. The motto of the day was Sanum per Aquam, or Spa for short. It means 
healthy through water. Pipes from ancient times still supply the Trevi fountain. Up to the 19th century, the Roman water system was considered Europe's most advanced. The idea of piping water into cities has long since spread all over the world. Modern day water engineers demonstrate just what the Roman achievement made possible. The pleasant way of life in ancient Rome was also made possible by hard-working administrators. Was liegt an? Nur das wirklich Wichtige, bitte. Leider gibt es heute einige Angelegenheiten, die nicht warten können. Die Stimmlisten für die nächste Wahl sind wohl am wichtigsten. Und dann sind wieder eine ganze Reihe neuer Bittschriften eingetroffen, die sich besonders an euch ja, richten. Ja. The Roman upper classes were neither lazy nor decadent. On the contrary, they were hard-working and ambitious, and they held the empire together. It was only a few hundred men who governed the 60 million subjects of the empire. A handful of managers ran the mega-enterprise of the Imperium Romanum. So geht das nicht. Beeil dich. They were the workaholics of their day. Treasury officials, town planners, or distributors of food all labored to ensure that the empire ran smoothly. They organized the transport of goods to the capital. Wine and oil came in amphorae, mainly from Spain. From North Africa, they brought horses for the army. Gaul provided iron, amber came from Germania, and Britannia delivered wool. The most important commodity of all, grain, came from Rome's richest province, Egypt. The land of the pharaohs was the mighty empire's breadbasket. The Egyptians had grown grain on the fertile banks of the Nile for thousands of years. A large part of their harvest now went to Rome, which consumed 300,000 tons of grain a year. Bread for the masses was an instrument of power in Rome. If the people weren't hungry, they were quiet. Roman rulers knew that stability in the empire rested on stability in Rome. It meant filling a lot of stomachs. Es scheint, dass eure Ernte dieses Jahr besser ist. Das wird den Präfekten freuen. Die 100 Scheffel können wir dann bestimmt im August liefern. Es sind 300. Und Rom erwartet eine pünktliche Lieferung. Immer nur Rom. Ihr seid unersättlich. Rom. Rom ist die Welt. Und vergiss niemals, das Imperium wird weiter wachsen. In southern Rome, there is a mound of shattered amphorae that stands 35 meters high. It is a testament to how many people had to be fed in ancient Rome. Olive oil was transported to Rome in clay pots, which were used once and then disposed of here at Monte Testaccio, the mountain of shards. Aquí, este amphora, estos fragmentos, Son de ánforas africanas. Se reconocen porque la pasta es muy fina y tienen un sonido metálico bastante notorio. Dividiendo el peso que los geólogos han calculado del testacho por el peso de una ánfora, podemos llegar a la conclusión de que lo que todavía queda, y de aquí se ha perdido mucho material, representaría aceite suficiente para alimentar 
a una población de un millón de habitantes durante 250 años. To feed over a million people in Rome alone, the administration had to run smoothly. Wenn das so weitergeht, kann ich nichts tun. Die Boten werden bestimmt bald da sein. Und ich möchte diese Vertröstungen nicht mehr hören. Wann genau ist die nächste Senatssitzung? Nächste Woche. Hm. Und was haben wir? Die Liste mit den Steuereinnahmen ist heute früh eingetroffen. Und wie sieht es aus? Bisher hat nur Ägypten geliefert. Das ist nicht genug. Das wird niemals reichen. Britannien, Gallien, Mauritanien. Was ist mit denen? Kümmere dich darum. Schick mir Boten, verdoppel die Reiter und bring mir die Einnahmen sofort. Controlling the empire would have been impossible without an extensive network of roads. So, transport routes were created throughout the empire. The many legionaries stationed in the provinces had to work as builders' laborers. Little by little, the Romans built paved roads all over the empire. The roads ran from the capital to the outermost borders, through woods and wilderness, past army camps, villages and towns. The Roman transport system was unparalleled. Goods, people and news could travel easily from Rome to Spain, to Britannia, Gaul or Germania, to the Black Sea or North Africa. The Roman roads remained a boon to Europe for centuries after Imperial Rome itself had disappeared. Many of today's most important transport routes still follow the roads that once crisscrossed the Roman Empire. The Roman principle of linking places through sophisticated infrastructure and logistics lives on on land, at sea and in the air. Rome's rulers invested in entertainment as well. Arenas were built all over the empire. The greatest of them was the Colosseum. There were regular gladiator shows in the giant amphitheater. The gladiators were Rome's stars. Their lives were mostly short, but exciting. In the gladiator schools, they were well looked after. They received regular massages and had the best doctors. The lucky ones only had to fight three times a year. Some had their own agents who took good care of their protégés. After all, they hoped to recoup their expenses out of the generous prize money. The fearless fighter's blood was even traded as a potency drug, the Viagra of the ancient world. The women of Rome idolized the gladiators. <laughs> no one has died in battle in the Colosseum for a very long time. But 2,000 years ago, it was a different story. In the so-called games, hundreds of thousands of prisoners of war, criminals, Christians and gladiators lost their lives either fighting each other or facing wild animals. The idea of staging spectacles in huge arenas was born in Rome. There, the concept of bread and circuses was politically driven. In the 21st century, it's a matter of entertainment and money. But the appetite for spectacle remains the same, even if no one has to die to thrill the spectators. Today's stars are footballers. Like the gladiators, they can earn a fortune for themselves and their agents. 
and they too are idolized by their fans. Citizens of Rome had one enormous privilege. In the eyes of the law, they were all equal. While slaves were at the mercy of their masters, all Roman citizens, without exception, had the protection of Roman law. Plaintiffs were usually represented by a lawyer. They often prepared their case in the public latrines. Sie hat mich betrogen. Ja, und so war ich hier sitze mehr als nur einmal. Das hatten wir doch schon. Die Frage ist, hast du Beweise? Handfeste Beweise. Alle Welt weiß doch, dass sie mich betrogen hat. Man ruft es durch die Gassen. Und was ist mit ihrem Sohn, den sie nach unserer Scheidung geboren hat? Der sieht mir überhaupt nicht ähnlich. Ist das kein Beweis? Wer kann trotzdem von euch sein? Wir brauchen Beweise, keine Gerüchte. Ich werde es dem Richter erklären. Und er wird mir glauben. Hör zu. Ihr müsst zu einer Einigung kommen, sonst wird das ein langer, teurer Prozess. Ich behalte Ihre Mitgift und Sie werden das vor Gericht für mich durchfechten. Das wird nicht leicht sein. Viel haben wir nicht in der Hand, aber ich werde in dieser Sache nichts unversucht lassen. Abgemacht? Ich melde mich, wenn ich noch etwas herausfinde. So machen wir es. Il diritto romano, come gli altri diritti, nasce dall'esigenza di dare un ordine alla comunità, senza il quale non sarebbe possibile la pacifica convivenza, non sarebbero sicuri gli scambi e anche la vita del singolo sarebbe a rischio. Il diritto romano si fonda sui mores, sui costumi degli antenati, che vengono seguiti da tempo immemorabile e alle usanze si affianca la legge. The Romans were a litigious people. Their courts were open to the public, and many citizens attended them as a pastime. Aspiring lawyers had to train long and hard. As there was no formal legal education, they learnt from experienced lawyers. Warum denn hier? Ich verstehe nicht, warum das hier sein muss. Dann zeig mal, was du kannst. Los! Ihr Römer! Nein, Haltung! Brust raus! Nochmal! Ihr Römer! Lauter! Du musst auf dich aufmerksam machen. Und du musst deine Arme besser benutzen. Große Gesten sind wichtig. Weiter. Ihr Römer! Would-be lawyers practiced their elocution and rhetoric for years in the hope that one day they would be able to speak before a court. Na, geht doch. Aber du hast noch viel zu lernen. Und Cicero, der hat auch mal klein angefangen. Tägliche Übung, das ist es. Come jetzt. The speeches of Cicero were essential reading for lawyers in training. Cicero was the most famous Roman orator of them all. Generations of lawyers modeled themselves on him because only a brilliant speaker could win the day in court. A Roman trial proceeded much as trials do today. First, the plaintiff presented his case. It was then considered in the presence of the defendant. A jury delivered its verdict. They had cards with A for absolvo, acquittal, and C for condemno, conviction. The penalties ranged from simple fines to banishment to death in the arena. If the majority of the jury abstained, the verdict was in dubio pro reo, when in doubt, for the accused. Ci sono due tipi di processo. C'è il processo pubblico, eh, 
è il caso ad esempio dell'omicidio in cui è la comunità che interviene a punire il colpevole e in questo caso a giudicarlo sono i cittadini stessi riuniti nel comizio. Quando invece ad essere leso è un interesse del singolo cittadino, come nel caso del furto, è colui che ha subito il furto a doversi recare dal magistrato per chiedere giustizia. Political crimes were prosecuted in extraordinary courts, which were also open to the public. But the law itself was the same for all citizens. Everyone had the same protection, rich and poor, men and women. Roman women had more freedom than Greek women. Political office was closed to them, but before the law, they had the same rights as men. Wir sind nach Recht und Gesetz geschieden. Und er verweigert mir die Mitgift. Herr Richter, dieses Gesetz gilt bei Ehebruch nicht, nicht mehr. So schnell. Welches Gesetz sie gilt oder nicht, entscheide immer noch ich. Herr Richter, sie hat einen Sohn bekommen, der ihm überhaupt nicht ähnlich sieht. So was soll schon mal vorkommen. Aber in diesem Falle? Der Junge hat blaue Augen und rote Haare. Wir wollen, dass sie ihn hier zeigt, aber sie weigert sich. Sie hat was zu verbergen. Habe ich nicht. Der Junge ist dein Sohn. Diesem Mann geht es doch nur um mein Geld. Du hast meine Ehre beschmutzt. Und deshalb steht das Geld mir zu. Kannst du das beweisen? Korrekt. Ohne Beweise habt ihr nichts in der Hand. Wir hätten zwei Zeugen. Und wo sind eure Zeugen? Sie weigern sich noch auszusagen. Aber nicht mehr lange. Was immer die sagen, ich werde mein Geld bekommen. Und jetzt möchte ich gehen, ich habe noch zu tun. Auf Wiedersehen. Le donne romane hanno maggiori diritti e maggiore libertà rispetto alle donne greche, ma con delle limitazioni. Quindi possono essere titolari di diritti civili, non di diritti politici, ma non hanno capacità di agire, cioè non possono compiere da sole tutti quegli atti che sono necessari per acquisire un diritto o per estinguerlo, come ad esempio comprare o vendere un fondo. Alla morte del pater familias la donna diventa sui iuris, ma a differenza dei figli maschi che diventano a loro volta patres familias, la donna è soggetta alla potestas del tutore. Roman law was perhaps the empire's biggest export. No other set of laws has had such a strong influence on later legal systems. In Germany, every law student still has to study Roman law because it is the backbone of the legal systems of continental Europe. Nor is it only European courts that follow the tradition of Roman law. The Charter of the United Nations in New York is also based on Roman principles. But there were peoples who wanted no part of Rome. They never accepted the supremacy of Roman law over their own laws and customs. In border areas, where there were frequent uprisings, the Romans were ruthless in imposing their version of justice. Ich verurteile die Angeklagten wegen Hochverrats zum Tod am Kreuz. The subject peoples in the empire's north were always rebellious, and they weren't the only ones. The legionary's most dangerous opponent was the Parthians of Persia. The Picts made frequent raids into the Roman province of Britannia. In North Africa, the Berbers attacked the Romans again and again. 
Most feared of all were the Germanic tribes, who were always on the point of rebellion. They lived in mist and cold, in seemingly endless forests. To the Romans, it was nothing but wilderness. There were no towns. There was nothing the Romans recognized as civilization or law and order. It was a world entirely different from Rome, a world that filled the Romans with fear. But more dangerous than all the wild men of the north was a single Roman officer, Arminius. Arminius had been taken from his Germanic tribe as a child and raised as a Roman. He spoke Latin and was well versed in Roman weaponry and tactics. He returned home as a Roman officer in command of Germanic auxiliaries. But Arminius never felt that he truly belonged to Rome. So he swapped sides. In secret, Arminius rallied the Germanic tribes. Perhaps he hoped to rule the united Germania as king. What is certain is that he planned a decisive blow against Roman colonization of his country. Ich habe an ihrer Seite in Pannonien gekämpft. Und ihre Legionen rücken geordnet in Reih und Glied mit solcher Wucht vor, dass wir bei einem offenen Angriff untergehen würden. Dann werden wir sie eben auf dem Marsch angreifen. Ihr Trost zieht sich träge wie ein Lindwurm meilenweit durch die Ebene. Aber Varus zieht mit drei Legionen. Das sind fast. 20.000 Mann! Wir sind ihnen unterlegen. Wir können sie nicht überall gleichzeitig angreifen. Völlig aussichtslos. Doch sie fürchten unseren Wald. In 9 AD, Arminius and his allies lured the Romans into a well-laid ambush. Three full legions walked into the trap, and the Germans sounded the signal to attack. In the Battle of the Teutoborg Forest, all three Roman legions were wiped out. It was one of the worst defeats that Rome ever suffered. Arminius is remembered to this day as the liberator of Germania from the Roman yoke. In the 19th century, a colossal statue was erected in his honor, the Hermann Monument. After this disaster, the Romans withdrew from all of Germania east of the Rhine. They made the river the new imperial border. To separate themselves from the barbarians, they built the Limes Germanicus, the largest fortification of its day, stretching 550 kilometers through present-day Germany. The Battle of the Teutoburg Forest was one of the most momentous of ancient times. It meant that the host of Germanic tribes east of the Rhine could live in freedom, an example of independence that Rome had always been reluctant to tolerate. A la longue und im Endeffekt war der Rhein eine klare und starke Grenze, nicht nur die Militärgrenze Roms, sondern auch eine starke kulturelle Grenze. Das kann man ja noch heute erkennen. Zum Beispiel dadurch, dass die Franzosen Französisch sprechen, also eine romanische Sprache. 
Aber auch in Deutschland sieht man das. Hier in Trier zum Beispiel, wo es markante, tolle Überreste aus römischer Zeit gibt. Und die Rheinländer sind ja insgesamt sehr stolz darauf, dass sie die römische Zivilisation genossen haben. Und die Römer hätten auch gesagt, naja, bei uns ist alles zivilisiert und da drüben auf der anderen Seite, da ist das Barbarikum. Oder aber auch, das hätten die Germanen gesagt, die Germania Liberadas, freie Germanien. The tribes east of the Rhine and the Limes were free. But their freedom came at a price. It meant continuing to live in simple huts in small scattered villages. It was a life without the advantages of civilization and certainly without luxuries. But millions of other people who had initially resisted the Romans became reconciled to the empire for the advantages it brought them. Instead of getting bogged down on muddy tracks, they could travel easily on paved roads. People who had lived in wooden huts moved into stone houses. Some even had underfloor heating. In the cold north, it made life a lot easier. For many, Roman rule meant the coming of the good life. And the Romans laid on entertainment in large amphitheaters. Remnants of Roman civilization can be seen wherever the Roman writ ran. There are the magnificent baths and the multi-level aqueducts stretching for hundreds of kilometers. There are the countryside amphitheaters and the huge arenas in the cities. The Romans carved their culture in stone. They left their mark not only in Europe, but in North Africa as well. There were many advantages to being a Roman province. Der Vorteil für die Provinzen war die Pax Romana, der römische Frieden. Und der bestand darin, dass die Römer mit ihrem sehr starken, mit ihrem überlegenen Rechtssystem diesen Frieden immer wieder über viele, viele Jahrzehnte, Jahrhunderte lang garantierten. Sie machten dies, indem sie überall eine städtische Verwaltung einrichteten. Das heißt, die Leute organisierten und verwalteten sich selbst. Am Ende hatte man dann nicht nur das Recht und den Frieden und die gute Regelung des Streites, sondern auch fließendes Wasser, eine gute Technik, gut funktionierende Straßen und eine ordentliche Verwaltung, die man sich heute in manchen europäischen Ländern immer noch wünscht. And yet the Roman Empire collapsed, despite having the best army in the ancient world, and despite the plentiful supplies and the many freedoms enjoyed by Roman citizens. The empire gradually declined. Its fall has often been blamed on moral decay, but this was not the main cause. Internal rivalry weakened the empire because there was no system for an orderly transfer of power from one emperor to another. From the third century on, this became a chronic problem as would-be emperors fought it out. They were no longer fighting external enemies, but their own countrymen. On top of the crisis at home came pressure from outside. The borders came under siege from the migration of whole peoples. In the fourth century, Huns, Vandals and Goths flooded into the imperial territory. Often they were only looking for a better life, but their influx sealed the fate of the superpower. In the fifth century, the Roman Empire ceased to exist, but its legacy is enormous. For it is not only stadiums expertly designed for mass spectacles that the modern world owes to Rome.
we also owe to the Romans the whole idea that a functional infrastructure is the necessary underpinning of a successful society. The memory of the Roman peace as the world once knew it still shapes Western policy today. Our understanding of law and justice manifested today in the International Court of Justice dates back to the Romans. Finally, and not least, it was a Roman emperor who elevated Christianity as the state religion. In Rome, the foundations were laid for Christianity to write the history of the world after the Roman Empire.